Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women Wednesdays. We're so glad you're joining us here for another important conversation. My name is Tamara Smith, and I'm one of the co-hosts here on Women Wednesdays. And as we get ready, we want you to share. Share, like, um, make sure all of your friends, your coworkers, your classmates, whomever you're watching with are watching along with you. You can share the stream on Facebook. And of course, the video will live live on our Facebook page, on our Women Wednesdays Facebook page. Make sure you also like and follow and join our group as well. But before I continue getting on this Women Wednesdays is awesome train, let's go over to our founder and host, Barbara Westcott. I know she has lots to tell us as we get ready to welcome another wonderful speaker. Barbara? That's right. That's right. Hello, everybody. My name is Barbara Westcott. I'm the founder of Women Wednesdays. So what is Women Wednesdays? I say this every week. We're just, we're a collaborative community of women who really just can't wait to help each other succeed. We have a variety of programs and the programs are designed so women get visibility, get knowledge, but get connected because we can really tap into the power of each other and make incredible things happen, including making Tallahassee a number one city for women. So if you want to get involved with us, just go to womenwednesdays.com. It's an, it's an awesome opportunity. We'd love to collaborate with you. So I just want to take a quick moment to hand it over to Verlanda. So we have a program here called Guest Host. So Verlanda is not only the leader of our speaker series, you know, helping this whole thing come together, but she's also serving in the role of guest host. And that's something that anybody can do. And it's a great experience and it's good practice. So Verlanda, take it away. Introduce yourself and tell us about sort of being a guest host today. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rolanda Johnson. And as Barbara mentioned, I'm the Speaker Series Coordinator for Women Wednesdays. Um, and I'm also guest hosting today. This is really cool. Second week in a row that I'm in front of the camera. So I'm really excited. Um, thank you, Tamara. Um, if you are um, interested in speaking for Women Wednesday, I'd love to connect with you. Please send us a message on Women Wednesday. You can message me directly on Facebook. Um, let's schedule a time. We'd love to get your story out, your business out to all of the women in Tallahassee to make this the number one city for women in Tallahassee. This is an amazing topic today, and I'm excited to be sitting in this seat um, as a guest host because this is one that you will definitely want to tune into. Very informative. Um, Barbara, do yeah. you? Do yeah, you well, I just want to say just before I get started, there was something I wanted to get across. Um, we are going to have some pretty incredible um, speakers that are going to be on our program on November 3rd. And I'm just trying to like we called it a homework assignment, but that's um, has to do with a series called Unbelievable. And I know we're going to get to Robin in just a minute, but I just want to quickly ask her. I think she has seen that series and it, it's an incredible series about series about how these two women collaborated and captured a serial rapist. So Robin, can you just can you just confirm why I'm telling people why they need to watch this series and get ready for this incredible show we're going to have in November? Oh, absolutely. And thank you, Barbara and Rolanda and Tamara. It's so great to be with you today. Um, yes, this is an this is such an important show. And first of all, you should watch it just because we all should understand that this is the state of our world. Right. That um, mm -hmm. when when people are victimized, you know, especially women, they are not believed. And and the complications of the systems that intervene um, that don't help are unfortunately still too much a reality. So uh, this is a compelling, wonderful story. And it's I'm in awe that you will have um, people who are this was based on on the show. I mean, th this is just an these are the two cops. These are the two yeah. women investigators out in Colorado who, you know, again, through the power of collaboration, they collaborated. They were from different, you know, police districts and everything. But, you know, women are really good about collaborating and their work together led to this. But the entire story about this um, young woman not being believed and just like what you're saying, Robin, the whole environment that surrounds that and leads to that yes. is just a really important conversation. So, which kind of leads us into today, you know, so Robin, thank you so much. I want you to tell a little bit about yourself, but also you have an important, you know, we're going to be talking about human trafficking and taking action. Cause I think there's something, if we all recognize what's going on around us, there's things that we all can do about it. So Robin, take it away. Tell us about you, but then, you know, let's hear about, um, let, teach us, let us learn from you. 
Well, thank you, Barbara. And and I would just like to take what you said and put it in a soundbite and put it on our website because it's exactly the message that the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center sends day in and day out, which is we all have a role to play. And the very first thing to do for all of us is to be informed and just to understand that human trafficking is a reality right here in, uh, in Leon County, in the greater Leon County area, in rural areas that surround us, and that everybody has a role to play in addressing it. Um, I founded, along with some others, this organization, STAC, the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center, in 2015. And we really formed it out of, of a bigger task force that was happening called the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And I think probably people can relate to this, that very often in communities, everybody's got a small piece of the puzzle to work in something out. And what we heard from law enforcement, from social service providers is that, if we encounter a survivor of trafficking, what do we do? If it's a sex trafficking or labor trafficking, if it's an older or younger, if it's an immigrant or a non-immigrant. And around town, thankfully, we do have different agencies that can help depending on who that person is, where they have been. But we needed a single agency to be a hub agency, to really be able to say, come to us, let us help figure out what you need as an agency or law enforcement or what that person very importantly needs. So that's what STAC is. It's a hub agency. We provide direct assistance to survivors of human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking. Um, I will tell you that our, our caseload has tripled since the onset of the pandemic. Um, one of the things that's happened is that uh, traffickers target vulnerable people. And of course, you know, the, the pandemic has made more people more vulnerable. I mean, Absolutely. just to put it, you know, in the most kind of short, short way as possible. So, so we've been working hard um, to keep up and, uh, and really the way we do our work best is to do things like this, to talk to all of us, because especially um, with the group of women, that's part of Women Wednesdays, and all the work that we do together, and I'm I'm joined in now. I'm happy to be part of uh, an official member. Yes, thank how, you for joining with us. Of course, um, but how we can all do this together? So that's the bottom line. And and if we can go through the slides we talked earlier. Let's let's have a conversation about what this is. And I I look forward to hearing questions from you know everybody of uh, Verlanda, especially as a guest guest host. You know maybe you want to. Um, you know, feel free to, to pop in and interrupt me and let's talk about this issue. And, and also, um, being aware is one thing. The other thing is, how do you take action? And that's really what today's presentation is about. Okay, well, that's so excellent. Wanna, so, Tamar, are you able to get that slide up? Yes, I want to go ahead and do a disclaimer. I'm, as you can see, Chrissy is noticeably absent, and it's because I am helping her out and filling in. She's our producer and our content manager throughout these broadcasts. So, if you see technical difficulties, just send me good thoughts. Yeah, but that's okay. You know, again, with Women Wednesdays, we're, it's all about um, learning and growing. And so this is great practice. So do the Thank best you. you can and we'll work with you. Yeah. Okay, I'll be sharing again. Robin, once you get started, I'll be sharing again. Just give me one Well, minute. go ahead. You go ahead and get her slide right up. But uh, it, for, the, for starting us out, Robin, why don't you go ahead and, and, and tell us what is human trafficking? Sure, sure. And it's best to think about human trafficking really as number one, it's both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And also, let me start with a disclaimer. Some people got aware of this issue through the movie Taken, or maybe they watch it on SVU. Now, this is very different from, um, you know, unbelievable. It's not that. Sometimes right. Hollywood does it right, which they did in that series. Sometimes they sensational, sometimes they sensationalize, they, they sort of um, put it, put an issue or an event out there and really take away the essence of it and in order to make it more um, watchable. So that's unfortunately what happens a lot with, with human trafficking. And it makes people think number one, the biggest risk is people who are snatched off the streets and kidnapped. And that's not at all what happens. And we'll talk about more why that is not the case. Second is that it, it almost appears to be um, sex trafficking only, but labor and sex trafficking both happen um, and happen right here. So one of the things that you can see is, um, and by the way, I think, um, can I give you a tip um, tomorrow just to go up to that top and click on play from start? Would that do um, the, the thing to get us 
on the um, slide set. So the top left, right under home tomorrow? Yeah, right under home. If you click that, I think we'll be good to go. Perfect. Um, okay, so we can actually go to the next slide. Um, just so that I can go back a little bit and just talk again a little bit about we the go. advocacy <laughs> center. Yeah, what? <laughs> We're ready. Let's we're do it. Drive and Thrive Advocacy Center. Um, so this is what we do. And we're, we are affiliated and referral for the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And that's just the first time I want to tell you all that. There is something called the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And we'll give you that number. But just know that. And you can put that into your phone. And we'll have that info at the end. Um, as I mentioned, sex and labor trafficking is here. And we work hard to assist both, both victims and survivors and people at risk of sex or labor trafficking, regardless of ages or their immigration status, um, et cetera. And then we also well, can do- Can I just ask you real quick, Robin? Yeah. Is that something when, when people, well, people think of this, do they think of both sex and labor trafficking? Is that something like they equally understand or is- they do not, No, usually people only think about it at, under sex trafficking um, mm -hmm. because frankly, that's where most of the arrests have taken place, especially in our area. Uh, I will say most, meaning all, um, we have had labor trafficking cases just, you know, uh, west of here at the Sandestin Hilton, by the way, there was a big labor trafficking case of, of women who were labor trafficked to be part of the housekeeping staff there. Um, so that was the King case. But here in our, our community, we know that there's labor trafficking going on because we're assisting victims, right? Um, and so, and, and law enforcement does a lot of investigating, but I think because, um, first of all, prostitution is a crime, vice units, um, others have had a lot of experience with crimes against persons in terms of sex crimes, that very often it's, an, it's, it's more common to see those cases uh, be arrested and prosecuted. Um, believe me, they're equally horrific and whatever we can do to end them, we will. So you're right. I mean, it's, it's not all people don't get it. In fact, one of the, when we talk about it often, I just say, you know, understand that human trafficking is both sex and labor. Um, and we do community education. And so uh, we've done a tally, I think from our inception, we've trained over 8,000 people, professionals, law enforcement, healthcare, community members, faith community. So we do this kind of thing a lot and are just always grateful for the opportunity. Okay, next slide. Robin, as we go to the next slide, can I ask a quick question for educate myself and for our listeners? Can you give us what's a brief um, case of labor trafficking? Like how would we even know what that is, what that looks like? Sure. And, you know, I am going to have some labor trafficking indicators, but I'll tell you what it looks like. Um, it looks like when you are perhaps um, in a hotel and you see a housekeeper who might show, um, you know, signs of abuse, she might be looking down, she might look um, dehydrated or otherwise maltreated. Um, you might find other kind of workers around a business that similarly might be might look like they are not um, not well, not physically well, or you might see them like sitting at a restaurant and you, or and you see one person really controlling that other person. Um, so you might see that in a context too, where you know we've seen labor trafficking cases where um, and and again we'll talk about this more, but where the trafficker is often present or close to another person, very much controlling them, not allowing them to speak, not allowing them to even look at you and smile or have any kind of interaction, say in a salon setting, in a nail salon, et cetera. So we do see a lot of that happening as well. Like it, it's that controlling of one person by another person. You might hear a labor trafficking victim say they don't have their ID that the boss has it, or they're working off a debt, or you might see them, um, if you're around, say, in a mall, you might see that they live in um, the same place as they work. So there's all kinds of indicators, but we're going to talk a little bit more about those as well. Great. All right. Okay. So the next slide. Yes. And so here's just some, some basics um, to understand that, that we see this often in the criminal justice context, but we should realize it as a human rights violation. And it's, it's that idea that there is a person, a human controlling and exploiting another person for the purpose of some kind of commercial gain. 
So, um, so that is really the essence of trafficking. That exploitation can take place in a traditional labor setting like agriculture or I mentioned housekeeping um, or any kind of often low wage, um, low skilled jobs. But it can also be, you know, we've heard of nurses from the Philippines being trafficked here. So it's not just people who are, um, you know, have no education or little education. Um, you can see the numbers here, um, over 40 million annually. And also knowing that, and this stat blew my mind, that basically if you look at this global slavery index, 1.3 trafficked people per 1,000 is the U.S. average. So that's a lot. And when you think about our population here, people who come and go in our area, we know we have a lot more people who are being trafficked and exploited than are coming forward. Okay, next slide. Um, this is an unfortunate reality. Uh, Florida's third in the nation when it comes to trafficking. Number one is California. Number two is Texas. So here we've got a, a map that shows where some of the hot spots are, and those are the orange red areas with kind of a line across the panhandle. But know that that's not an indication of all these cases because trafficking takes place often behind closed doors. Victims are afraid. They're isolated, particularly during the pandemic. A lot of times human trafficking doesn't come to the fore. Also because when we, we look at a field or we look at a restaurant or we look at people doing landscaping, you can't tell that they're being trafficked, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes people say trafficking hides in plain sight. Okay, next slide. I mentioned this before, but what we've seen the result of, of uh, COVID-19 on human trafficking and the cases has really overall made people who were vulnerable before even more vulnerable. And also traffickers, and think of traffickers as some of the most nimble businesses, and by the way, it's both men and women who are traffickers, one of the most nimble organizations or operations that are out there. So they've taken advantage of COVID-19. Um, studies out of the national hotline show that online sex trafficking has exploded. We've also seen at the very beginning that agricultural workers were, were dubbed um, to be essential workers. And as such, they were, they were brought to this country, allowed in this country with, with visas, with legal visas. But once here, they were um, isolated, they were defrauded, they were not paid, they were treated horribly, they were essentially enslaved when they got here. We know too that traffickers have used the um, language around or, or, or used information as a tool to keep people under control. So they'll lie to them about the dangers or the risks of, of COVID-19 to either isolate them further or put them at risk because they might, you know, they might threaten them to control them around that. Um, we've heard of traffickers and the similar thing with domestic violence abusers say just, you know, refuse to give someone access to a vaccine um, or um, PPE, you know, masking, et cetera. So that was a way to control them. We know about how many are out of work and really the people who are out of work are mostly women and mostly women in low wage, low skilled jobs, particularly women of color. So, um, so again, if there's a vulnerability or a bias or any kind of, of limiting factor to people, it's gotten worse during the pandemic. Um, we've also seen as, as we've done our work locally, when we've tried to shelter, find shelter for people that nonprofits are really having a hard time. You know, we not only have we not been able to get out and, and raise funds so that we can sustain ourselves, but we've had to, to operate under new conditions where we can't have as many people in one space, et cetera. And of course, the justice system, you know, talk to any lawyer or judge or law enforcement officer in town and you know how cases have been slowed tremendously. OK, next slide. Uh, you can see that really any, any vulnerable person can be trafficked. And I almost want to say anybody could be trafficked. I mean, we all have vulnerabilities at some level, right? I, I look mm -hmm. at the people um, who I hear about, I hear um, survivors often on many programs. And a lot of times I just say, there but the grace of God go I. Where was I as a young person? And I made a, a step toward path A instead of path B. And if I had done path B, who would have, you know, what would have happened? So any kind of vulnerability, um, traffickers are experts at honing in and figuring out who is the most vulnerable, often 
uh, coercing them into a relationship in a, in a very subtle way. So it might be they immediately find a runaway youth and promise them not just a house and um, a place to live, a new phone, clothes, et cetera, but they might promise them love and attention that they never got at home. That's why they ran away. And, and similarly, people who have other kinds of challenges, substance, use issues, any kind of um, immigration status that might be at risk, they'll they'll use that often what we call groom an individual, pull them into a trust relationship and then um, demand payback. So it's it's trafficking and seduction of a trafficker is really a process. And and these are but some of the folks that that we see who are particularly um, at risk. And, it, and if you think about it, take a step back. It's because that's what our society does or doesn't do to support people, right? People who already mm -hmm. look at our area with high poverty rates, really low access to a lot of affordable housing, um, who has access to healthcare, et cetera. All these things, the economic well-being of an area can affect, um, you know, somebody being vulnerable. Okay, next slide. And this next slide kind of um, surprises people sometimes. These are examples of who could be a trafficker. So neighbors, for, you know, relatives traffic. I, I mean, when we started this work, um, uh, I, I, I never heard the term parental trafficking, but I hear it now where family members traffic children. We've had, we've had a couple of cases here locally where a mom trafficked her daughter, um, sex trafficked her daughter from age three to 13. Um, and that was to support a drug habit, right? So, um, and then we hear uh, other places in the country, I've seen some of the most kind of fine, quote, upstanding citizens, business people. Also, we find out later they've been actually trafficking people from um, other countries or who are vulnerable. One of the biggest cases in the state of Florida is the Evans case, where the Evans family farm was trafficking people from homeless shelters around our state going under going to those places under bridges where where um, unhoused people gathered getting them into these vans saying promising them a, you know three hots and a cot place to live and work and then um, forcing them to work at a um, at their farm in Palatka so it's that targeting of vulnerable people and any of these people could be um, traffickers okay next slide so um, just thinking about this, let me pose it to our um, to our panel and to people who are in the audience and listening. What do you think would make us here vulnerable to sex or labor trafficking? I mean, I think I, I was thinking about that and I knew you were going to ask that. And I kind of wonder about we're a, a big community that does you know, big things, a big university, state government, all that sort of stuff. But in terms of what we do um, for opportunity for everyday people or people who, you know, are at, are at like a, a hardship level, mm -hmm. you know, with that type of opportunity. So I wonder, if, you know, getting opportunity to more people earlier, you know, are we, are we so busy doing big things that we, we don't have space for you know, the people that need the help the most sometimes in terms of finding opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll mm -hmm. chime in. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Robin. Chrissy. Hi, Chrissy. The power is here, here everyone. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, I think what makes Leon County vulnerable to sex or labor trafficking is the highway uh, where we're located. Um, I do think that that is a um, direct link to trafficking and so to speak, because of uh, where it intersects along um, state lines. And so I think that that may be one of the reasons why there we are more vulnerable to that as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And while you don't need movement to have trafficking, but traffickers often move victims all over, whether it's interstate, whether it's just along I-10. You know, some people um, you might think about, you've seen some of the stories in the press, I'm sure, about the arrest at the I-10 North Monroe area. So you've got, you know, you've got that as a sort of trafficking hotspot. You've got hotels and motels there. You have a lot of transients. Um, in fact, there's a the Leon County uh, Commission has a task force. I'm on it to look at some of the challenges in that North Monroe corridor area. And some of it is the transients that you mentioned. 
Um, I think someone in the chat just said, and Alex, who is our social media guru, great to know you're with us, Alex, talked about a lot of rural areas. Um, and yeah, you don't even think about that, but people who are in rural areas and who are trafficked are, like she says, out of sight, out of mind, fewer resources perhaps available, um, maybe not being get, able to get help, um, might be, say, migrant farm workers in Gadsden County who might not have access to um, perhaps services, language specific. You know, we're, we um, right now, our caseload is probably half labor trafficking survivors. And some of those survivors speak a dialect of Spanish. They don't speak Spanish. So even finding someone who speaks that dialect and can communicate for those who are not also Spanish speakers is a challenge. So there's all kinds of isolating factors that can happen. Um, we also have, uh, we're a great big service uh, economy. We, we have millions of people come in and out of our area every year. And that means they might be coming for sporting events. They might be coming for concerts or festivals. Anytime where there's a demand for low wage labor, um, or whether there's a demand for labor, period. And right now we are in a, you know, a lot of demand out there. People need workers. Um, you can find exploitation could happen. So, um, so all that's here. Um, in addition to the things that kind of those structural issues, Barbara, that you mentioned. Um, and we're also as, as kind of a hub County for a lot of services, you know, the, the, homeless and house services, um, disc village, legal, um, legal services in North Florida all have offices in our rural areas, but a lot of them are based here. So people come to our area also for services and we've been hit hard by COVID, you know, so all that, all that kind of make, we're not immune. In other words, we, it, it is definitely happening here. Okay. Next slide. Were there any things else, else in the chat? Um, for those of you who are, um, looking at the chat, I think that was it. Okay. I think that was it. Yeah. All right. And so, um, so one of the things, because we are um, with Women Wednesdays, really focused about women as entrepreneurs, connecting and supporting, and that we as women are consumers. We are, you know, we we're out there in the community. Really want to talk about businesses and what the business community can do, and hopefully inspire some action with everybody. Okay. Next slide. So one of the things about um, about this is is really thinking about how the business community is impacted and can impact trafficking, right? So, um, so all these things are anathema to business. Like we don't want as business leaders and as business um, entrepreneurs or business owners in our community increase criminal activity, right? And we call trafficking a crime of crimes because a trafficker doesn't just you know, do this one act of violence toward one person. They launder money. They um, don't pay their taxes. They um, they steal identities. They commit a range of physical and other kinds of crimes against people. So stopping trafficking makes us have a safer community. Um, and also it clearly tears apart um, the fabric of our community because you've got all of these impacts with criminal activity and and the, and the impact on, on a, a, an individual's um, a very existence if they're trafficked because that trauma is is horrific and it's often lifelong. Um, doing the right thing and addressing this issue, of course, both for survivors and for our whole community brings us safety, security, and justice. And I, I, again, it seems like that's what we're all about, right? We all want to do that. Okay, next slide. So um, I, I mentioned business too. You might have seen that um, Stack was so um, fortunate, grateful that Leon County last July passed a, um, an, a an item to create a training program for all businesses in Leon County, and Stack is taking the lead on creating this. And I'm going to give you information about how you can sign up, but how we can make sure that every business in our community, and it would be great, I'm thinking ladies, for Women Wednesdays to help talk about this when we release it. Absolutely. It'll be a brief online training so that you can make your workplace safer, because if you don't, I just you know told you a little bit, and you've heard a little bit about why it's risky to have trafficking be in and around you. Um, a reputational, I, I when I was doing some research for Commissioner Minor, 
way back, um, I actually Googled North Monroe and human trafficking and something came up on, it wasn't Yelp, but it was another site. It was tra travel uh, trip advisor that said, don't stay in a hotel around North Monroe and I-10 because there's trafficking there. Right. So there's a, a hit to the reputation of, of all these businesses in that area because mm -hmm. that happened there. So how can a business fortify itself against it? Right. And, and not only that, do the right thing and be family friendly and safer. Um, it'll only help businesses clearly financial impact um, to, for being sued. We're seeing more and more survivors um, bringing civil actions against hotels and others for failing to act to protect them when they were being trafficked within the, premises of those businesses. And of course, there's legal liability. And you can see the next slide and understand why um, a big firm out of New York is the Pillsbury Law Firm actually um, is, is doing training for lawyers on how you can um, really take up the mantle of trafficking survivors um, and sue corporations for failing to do the right thing. So anyway, so when all else fails, you know, you got to protect yourself from legal liability. OK, the next next slide, please. Um, and I like these quotes as well, because especially the one on the left, um, so these are from Cyrus Vance, a Manhattan DA, who basically says, with the help of banks and other financial institutions, his office has been able to secure convictions against traffickers without having to rely on the testimony of victims um, who suffer uh, emotional, physical or sexual abuse. And I'm telling you, that is so important. Um if you could bring a successful case against a trafficker without having to re-traumatize a victim to testify, to sit for depositions, you know, to essentially be on call, like think about, think about the survivor of the Operation Stolen Innocence case here, right? 170 arrests, one victim, a child. And each time there's another case, she's potentially, um, needs to testify or needs to be present. So that hanging over somebody's head is horrific. Um, and it, and it hurts them from being able to move on. Anyway, I think you get the, the gist of this, which is businesses working together with law enforcement can protect, um, a survivor from having to be re-traumatized in the justice mm -hmm. system. But m more importantly, can act to just really stop this issue and um, and looking at it in these various ways. In this case, the financial sector taking a role is super important. Agreed. I wanted to, to add, Robin, that um, within my role at Florida Baptist Children's Homes and One More Child, um, we often also make that connection with churches. And I'm sure that's something you'll talk about and you you know lots about as well. Um, just kind of showing them, kind of filling that gap. There's a concern um, for trafficking victims, but a lot of times they're not sure where to start. How do we address this as a church? Because of course, the the horrendous um, act and um, and just the things that will happen to these victims are even more taboo sometimes to talk about within those religious and faith-based settings. So um, so you were talking about those impacts um, on the financial sector. Can you talk a little bit about how um, maybe some religious organizations have gotten involved as well or how they can? Absolutely. And, and you know, that's right. You are 100%. And faith communities have been so important on this issue. Um, here locally, let me not forget to just mention on October, and we'll talk about other October events, but October um, 15th and 16th, um, there's going to be a summit um, brought by together by a group called Christians Against Trafficking, where they're bringing together churches from all over our area for um, a, a couple of, of days. One is the evening of Friday the 15th and the next day to really talk about how churches can do exactly what you're saying, Tamara. Um can be um, places of, of refuge, of help, um, the healing from trafficking. Sometimes um, it's so important for a survivor to be able to connect with their faith community and to get the, the guidance and support there that they need. And also to understand that faith communities, like any other place, are places where 
trafficking victims can actually be coming and attending. One of the big cases in South Florida was one where a trafficker let the victims go to church on Sunday, just allowed them to. They were so um, firmly controlled by that trafficker in terms of um, the psychological coercion that the trafficker felt like the victims could go to church. They wouldn't call the police. They wouldn't run away, et cetera, because they had so many psychological chains, if you will, around their, um, their being. Anyway, so these particular agricultural work or landscape workers were scavenging in a church's dumpster for food because the trafficker wasn't feeding them. And, a, and the pastor literally went out and said, how can I help and what's going on? And they told that pastor their story, which led to the prosecution of the um, labor contractor that was trafficking them, right? So you could actually be sitting next to someone in, on Sunday morning who might be trafficked and you, you need to be able to see those signs. Um, the ministries of many churches are, are so well established. Yeah, United Church in Tallahassee has been a huge supporter of Stack financially and otherwise um, can be a great places of, of referring people for help. So what else do you think about anything else tomorrow about, about what you all do at one child and, and Baptist children's home? Yes. Well, um, I know one thing that, that the, the pandemic has impacted one of our big events is, um, is called traffic stop and that's traffic spelled with a CK at the end. Um, just referring to our anti trafficking efforts um, at One More Child. And that's usually um, at the beginning of legislative session um, in January um, here here in Tallahassee in our capital city. And, um, you know, I think it's, there's kind of a, a conversation that has to be had um, with faith-based communities. Um, I know when I've spoken at churches before, just kind of seeing faces, you know, uh, shocked, um, kind of the subject matter sometimes that we have to go into terms um, in talking about uh, trafficking efforts um, or anti-trafficking efforts. And, um, but I don't think that it should stop them from, from getting involved. So we're really thankful for what you and your organization um, do here, Robin, because you've been a consistent voice. And even when I've spoken to churches, I've heard about what you're doing. And that's awesome. But I think if we continue to do that, they continue to say, you know, even in those services, you can say children are going to do something different this day um, so that the adults can ask questions and really, you know, get to know more about what they can do and even their small, their small acts can, can have an impact. Absolutely. Well, I would think your training programs are a key part of that. I mean, you know, just having it in front, front and center in front of you and just having some training and some steps to take is probably a big help too. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, it's all faith in all areas. Um, I, I have to say one of the, one of the really um, moving things that happened last spring at Passover was Congregation Shamre Torah had a program where they created a Passover meal and did a cooking class showing how you could make food that is in a trafficking free um, supply chain. They also talked about how really Passover is about the Jews escaping the enslavement of Egypt, right? So it's looking back at what it what it was, the essence of Passover and making it relevant to today and how people are controlled and also, you know, trafficked. And they um they did a they they also did a great program. Um so it really faith communities are vital. Mm -hmm. I've, got a, I've got a question yeah. as far as yeah. like identifying factors as a community as a whole what can we do to really open our eyes to human trafficking and is there any signal or sign where that may be good indicators that someone is being trafficked as a community how can we combat that yeah let's do this let's go to the next slides the next three slides pretty quickly and i have a slide of indicators chrissy that i'd like to put up for you so just so you all know, you, this is a survey that was done where trafficking survivors told them exactly where they were trafficked. So in this case, you can see 
um, just large numbers that were in this case trafficked at hotels were staying there. They were used during transit. Um, yeah, someone says you have to speak the same language as if, if that's what you're talking. That's a really important thing. So let's do the next slide. You can see how hotels and motels are affected. <clears throat> and also we see that the transportation industry, these are all places if you if you are on any of these um you know, you know like you you're in a modes of transportation. Car. Yeah, you're on an airplane. You could be sitting next to a trafficking survivor. So know that this is not like separate from our daily life. Um, we are around, potentially around people who are trafficked all the time. And all of these businesses too, understanding what it might look like is important. Okay, let's do the next slide. So here's what your, um, your, your, uh, oh, and also, I, I just highlighted in yellow, these are ex, these are industries here locally where our stack's current caseload is assisting people who have been trafficked in these areas or have recently been um, assisting people in these areas. So this, that's all right here, all these things. Um, all right, next slide. And that's our indicator slide, I think. So what could you see? <clears throat> so as a community, Chrissy, this is part of, of what you might see if you're if you're interacting, and again, you can look at those last two slides and think about hotels and motels and go, okay, um, if I'm happy, happening to be checking in at the same time as somebody at a hotel, or if I'm working in an office where I'm passing uh, people who are at a, a local cantina, what, what should I be looking at? So here are some indications. Um, and often with, with branding, we used to see um, trafficking survivors be branded very, um, you know, out there like on arms and in places where people could see. Sometimes now what traffickers do is they brand them in places that are covered by clothes, clothing or inside someone's mouth, like in, literally, literally inside their lips. There might be um, various uh, tattoos with, with dollar signs, with the trafficker's name, with a gang symbol, other things to indicate really literal ownership of one person of another. Um, also know that too, if you're under the age of 18, if, if there's a, a, any commercial sex involved um, with that person who's being trafficked, with that child being trafficked, you don't have to have forced that child. Any child who's involved in the sex industry, commercial sex industry in any way, is a victim of human trafficking. Sometimes you see two indications where you might be, say, checking somebody in um, for a medical appointment and they say, oh, I don't have my ID. The boss keeps my ID. Well, that's kind of a sign, too, because it's indicating that someone doesn't have control over their own documents. Um, you might hear somebody talk about um, working and living in the same place, owing a debt, um, witnessing somebody with, um, you know, terrible, again, in a healthcare setting or others, um, where somebody continues to work even though they're injured. And maybe you see that when you're going to the mall or you're, you're um, just at any other kind of retail establishment. That's an indication that that person doesn't have agency or doesn't have control over their own life. So when people say, what are the indicators? That's the first one I always like to share with people. You see somebody who looks like they're being controlled. They, they say they can never visit friends or family. They, they don't have access to a phone. Anything that indicates somebody doesn't have control over their own life is an indication that they could be controlled by somebody else and they're possibly being trafficked. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It, it does. I just saw somebody chat in, oh my Lord. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, but yeah, you know, that's the essence of it is control exploitation and control of one person over another person. And, and again, often it's, it's never the victim's fault that this happens. You know, somebody, um, we had a case where a woman who was at the Carney center talked to our advocate and said, Hey, I just found out about this. Looks like great job. I, I learned about it online, but they want me to show up at this one spot with, um, with like a khaki shirt and a uh, khaki pants and a dark shirt. They won't tell me where we're going. They won't explain why I can't do this work from um, Tallahassee. They told me not to tell any of my, my friends or family because they'll be so excited when I just send money home. They'll be, you know, and here's a ton of red flags, right? Uh -huh. Targeting a vulnerable person, making it sound really good. And in these vulnerable times, somebody might say, yeah, this sounds really good. Let, let's go, you know, but this woman said, something's not right. Right. You know, so it's that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think like for all of us, 
I think sometimes you just have that feeling like, look, so you see something, you think something's just not right about this. Exactly. And and we've mm-hmm. heard, um, I've got a call from a hospital worker, TMH, who just said, talking to my other colleagues here, our Spidey sense, our Spidey sense, some Spider-Man movie was out. Yep. So it's like <laughs> our Spidey senses are through the roof, right? So mm-hmm. something's not right. I don't like the way this guy is standing there. I don't like what he's saying to her. She just had, you know, there were just all these signs that they were trying to put together because it's hard to give a checklist, but the Mm -hmm. idea of agency is the major one. So let's do the next slide and talk about taking action. Um, I will say, and I just thought of this um, quickly. I had a mentee say to me one time that she was worried about her friend because her friend had started an OnlyFans account and, you know, it's a social media, it's another type of social media platform where, you know, you can have just who you would like. You can either charge, they use it for different reasons, but she had a friend, that was, this was a high schooler, that had an account and that there was one person where she did sexual things for, for money um, that nobody knew about. It was a secret. And... Uh, she had one person on the account that was starting to contact her outside of that account. Um, when she said that to me, the first thing I said was, does, does anyone know what she's doing? You can, t-, I was like, this is an instance where you can tell on her because I think that what she was falling into could have definitely been a trafficking situation if she had started to either see this person Mm -hmm. um, in person or, you know, tell them, tell them where she lives or something like that. Um, So is there ever instances where people just don't know what they're falling into? Oh, um, yeah. Yes. Like a slippery slope. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially because traffickers will deliberately be that good guy, the benefactor or the, the understanding woman. Think about the whole Jeffrey Epstein situation. Um, you know, there was always an older woman talking to these younger girls or sometimes trafficker traffickers. Um, get younger girls to talk to other younger girls or boys. I've been saying girls a lot because we're in Women Wednesdays, but please know that boys and men are trafficked. Um, boys and men are sex trafficked. And it's an across the, you know, kind of an equal opportunity victimization that can happen. But yeah, that is exactly right. That whole idea that someone can be sort of convinced that this is really great. I can bring home money to help my mom, you know, get it, you know, make the car payment this month if I do this or, or my status will be um, like improved. This guy is taking me to Disney. This guy is buying me, you know, uh, clothes and treating me like I, like he really loves and understands me. So there is that mm-hmm. absolute, absolute kind of drip by drip seduction and and grooming process. Um, this slide is just, uh, we did a training at Capital City Bank, um, an in-depth training with them. And, and this is just another you know example about how they've decided to take this issue seriously and to, um, to get more in-depth training. And I'll tell you this never, <laughs> not ever, rarely happens, but I did three trainings with their public facing staff. And after the second one, um, their bank security called and said, Robin, I think we saw something. Can you tell me who I need to talk to at DLE? So wow. um, at the Department of Law Enforcement. So immediately that traf- that training, uh, I think, got a criminal case going. Yeah, somebody says, Carrie, you're right. Um, most people don't know you're being trafficked. You're just, somebody's talking to you, understands you. Right? You're, you're being, it's very trusting. So let's go to the next slide. I think I mentioned a lot of what's in here in the next slide after this is that Leon County. Um, yeah, take it to the next slide there, Tomer. Yeah. OK, so um, this is what I mentioned. And I'd like to circle back with you later, um, Barbara, about this. But our goal is to a th- a train a thousand people um, on human trafficking with this online portal. You can pre-register essentially by going to this um, this link that's here. And um, we are gonna be rolling this out um, probably in January, Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And would love to, if anybody would like to beta test it, I'm thinking, um, Maybe um, maybe tomorrow you would like to beta test this with us. Not that you don't have anything else to do with a new baby, but um, 
but if anyone would like to do that, we are definitely um, going to be getting a number of folks together to give us some feedback, but, um, but we'll be working on this. And this is something, again, taking action to take the training when it's available, but then to also um, help us roll it out. Can I just ask you who who would be good um, sources to do the beta testing for? Because I think that's something that something I know it would help you, but I think it helps other people to take the beta test yeah. because they might want to do a beta test on something. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's helpful to do that. Oh, it is. It is. I know mm -hmm. exactly. I've done that. Um, so I would say um, it, it could be anybody. I would say if you are a business owner who has um, any contact at all with the pop, not an owner anybody in a business um, who has contact with the public, you could be helpful. Um, we are not necessarily targeting healthcare. So I'd say not healthcare. There's lots of good training out there for healthcare, but a, a retail, somebody in, um, in any sort of, you know, restaurant, um, somebody in the hotel industry, um, either as somebody who works in any aspect of a hotel or hospitality, um, really any, anybody who is in a business and in, might want to, you know, be able to help your sort of fellow business owners to have the best, most kind of elegant, impactful training that that's possible. So, so it's pretty broad. Okay, good. All right. So let me tell you next about some things that are going on here in Tallahassee um, and Leon County next week. Uh, the next slide here is about our big event, which is called Imagining Freedom. And um, if we could go to the next slide there. Yeah, so from the 13th to the 15th, we are having, this is kind of weird, y'all, I'll just tell you, we usually would have a big event, a dinner or something, but of course we have COVID. So these are a series of three days of intense online events. We're gonna have four learning, um, learning events. We're going to have um, business in town. For example, um, Red Eye Coffee is gonna have a special drink um, featuring Stack on the 15th to go there. Barbie Morrow, you know how absolutely fantastic um, Barbie and her whole, the whole organization is. They've been supportive of this issue and Stack for forever. Um, but we really want to encourage people to go to businesses that are, you know, have trafficking free supply chains and are supportive of survivors. Um, lots of free stuff to go um, that's happening then for you to become um, aware. 10 things you can do. We have a, that 10 things document that's really important for you to see, which is everything from learning the National Human Trafficking Hotline um, to being able to attend one of these events to getting ready for January, which is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. We can help you do that if you want to have a brown bag lunch at your business or you want to, you know, do something. So there's lots you can do. Um, the next slide is, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to, while you're, while you're getting ready to go to the next slide, I'll just sort of give another shout out to Red Eye and Barbara Morrow. Yes. But I mean, that's the, a great example of a business that's engaging, you know, for impact and supporting the community. And, um, and I just, I just, I love that you brought that up because I think it's, you know, it's another way for other business owners to feel, you know, to have that kind of impact locally as well. Yeah. And it's a way you can vote with your dollars for those mm -hmm. businesses that are doing the right thing, you know, who right. are walking the talk and who are actually saying we're, you know, we might, you know, be taking a business risk, but we want to buy coffee from these people, not those people, you know, but they're and then they're having a global impact and you're having a global impact by buying their coffee. Red Hill Small Farm Alliance is another one. They've taken an anti-trafficking um, position um, and and the first like farming agency in our, our, our association in our whole area to do that. So please support Red Hill uh, Small Farm Alliance as well. Um, the last slide is really the next one here is really to give you the information on what to do if you do see um, or suspect human trafficking, which is if it's a child, as I mentioned, any child who's being enticed, not even forced or you think is um, is being trafficked or is that, you know, is or a vulnerable adult call the abuse hotline. This phone number, um, put it in your phones now under human trafficking. So you have the National Human Trafficking Hotline Center. Um, this is a this is one of these uh, numbers that are multi um, lingual 24 seven, 365 days um, connects you with anybody in the country who's working on this issue. Stack is a referral source on there, for example, the, you know, other places like Stack. And of course, there's our talk and text number and an emergency of course always 911 
All right. Excellent. And well, I that, think that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're close to running out of time. So I want to say thank you so much for sharing this important information. And I just have a few quick questions before we, before you leave. And that is, um, how did you start this? Cause you're, you're the founder of this, like what <laughs> led you to start this organization and, and have the impact that you're having? Um, well, you know, it literally, it was a place, it was in, in Bangladesh and Dhaka in the capital where, um, I was there doing domestic violence training for those who've been around for a while. I've worked in the field of violence against women for a while. And we went to a shelter in Dhaka that sheltered not just domestic and sexual violence survivors, but also survivors of human trafficking. And I saw children there who had been trafficked boys who'd been trafficked as camel jockeys into Saudi Arabia. And it, it, it didn't just break my heart. It just inspired, it made me so mad. <laughs> That I th I said I have to do something. I just was such an horrific thing to have seen. Uh, just their eyes, like they weren't physically injured, but they're. I'll never forget their eyes. And I thought I just have to do something. And literally within sixty days, I got back here and got a call from the Human Rights Center at Florida State, Terry Coon, and saying, "Can you work with us? We're starting a human trafficking outreach um, network, um, and we're going to be doing some work here." statewide, would you help us? And I said, yes. Um, and that was uh, 15 years ago. Oh, wow. And like for you, just can you can you see some of the impact you've had? Like, you know, to have that courage to try to make a difference. Um, can you see that ripple? Can you see that, you know, we're having some impact, we're making progress? I, I believe we have every time we do a training, every time we get a call, I know that it, it just on a really individual level, we're getting calls from agencies, from people um, that we've never gotten calls from. I've gotten calls from people that I just know professionally. You say, Robin, there's something weird going on. Let me tell you what's happening at this house down the street or with these people that I just saw at the Publix. And so people are knowing that we exist and and survivors as well are calling. So I believe I believe we're making a difference. But again, it takes a village. You know, there's no way we do this work in any way without being held together with everyone else. So someone from Cape Cod. Yeah, nice. Yeah, Betsy. Hey, Betsy. But I think also like it's like deciding I want us to be a number one city for women and, you know, to, to sort of get that baked into our culture. Yeah. But I think, you know, what you're doing too, we need that baked into our culture like that. Yeah, there's, we're going to, we're all going to work on this together. We're not going to let that happen here. And we're going to, you know, move the needle. So we, you know, create a better community, a better world you know, so for everybody. So I, I just so applaud you. And it's, you know, that you've, you've taken this step and, you know, brought this, you know, subject to light and, and having impact. But I also, in looking behind you, you know, on a much, much lighter note, um, <laughs> you had mentioned that you're a jewelry maker. So yes. like so many women are do, doing these incredible things. Um, they're, they, they are, you know, that have this depth of things that they're doing. You are also a jewelry maker. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, only real quickly, because I know we're just at 12.59, but <laughs> yeah, I am okay. a, um, uh, it's a kind of the left brain, right brain thing. You can't see what's in front of me, but this is all the office stuff, the double monitors and the papers and the cabinets and all that. But behind me is my jewelry studio, essentially, where for the last, gosh, dozen years or so, it's like... You got to be you got to use those other parts of your brain, you know, when time disappears and you're doing something that's so creative and joyful. And for me, as a both a lawyer and as a you know, it's all left brain. I got to really get out of it. So so getting into my hand, getting into the dirt, if I'm gardening or getting playing with my beads. It's what we I think everybody has to do that, don't you, Barbara? I mean, you really I do. But I also think it's a cre it's also a part that same creative energy that has you, you know, doing jewelry or whatever. It's that like uh, that creative energy. It's almost like an inventor energy. It's like I can create things. I can do things. I can make beautiful jewelry, but I can also make a more beautiful world. You can you can take your energy and do things with it. And that's why I was asking you about are you are you can you sense that you're moving the needle? You know, none of these things happen overnight. Right. You know, when you're trying to you know make a big change and and you know do the work that you're doing, it doesn't happen overnight, but it it does happen. And so again, I just applaud you for well, for tackling you. this subject and and moving mm -hmm. it forward, and you know, again, making a better world. And thank you for the opportunity. We hope you all can join us next week and be a champion and join us for Imagine Freedom. Go have a great drink at uh, 
at uh, Red Eye on, on, on Friday. And, um, and thanks for all you do to empower. As much as we empower women and everyone around us, the harder time traffickers are going to have. It's really about Absolutely. fortifying all of us mm -hmm. and strengthening all of us in mind, body, and spirit and economically in all these ways that people are not going to be preyed on. Right. And it might, it might inspire some women to, to stand up for themselves too, you know, and just you feel stronger about not, not being victimized and, and knowing no that, that she can do other things. She can follow her passions in life and make, make great things happen too. So everybody look, thank you so much. I just want to mention next week for women Wednesdays, we have Dina Mims. She's going to be talking about when you're done, you're done. It's really about how do you pivot? You know, when there's no going back and you need to make a pivot and that's being able to pivot is actually a really powerful thing. Um, so she's going to be with us next week to talk about that. So remember your homework assignment. Start watching the Netflix series. Unbelievable. You'll be unbelievably happy that you watched it. And then, you know, stick with us next month on November 3rd when we do that. So, again, thank you. Thank you, Robin, for being with us. And everybody just have a wonderful, you know, week and we'll see you next week. But in the meantime, make sure you join with us at womenwednesdays.com. So Thank take you. care, everyone. Bye-bye.